Thank you, Mr. Yah. Good morning. So I was thinking, that's always dangerous when I do that, but I was thinking from the people working in the nursery to people traveling to people visiting people to people out sick, we are really small today, which means our online people are going to have to carry the amens today. So you're going to have to go in and comment on YouTube, amen, and carry us, bring us home, right? Because we're, we're pretty small today in person. We want to welcome you here in person, welcome you online as well, joining us today. Um, as, we're, as we're preparing, as we're going into the holidays, we thought it would be great to do a series on the things Jesus said about money. And so we started that last week. And last week we talked a good bit about our priorities and today we're really looking at contentment. I don't know if you're familiar with the old um, newspaper called Ask Maryland, where people would write a column that write into Maryland, then Maryland would answer. Um, there's been several of those, but this Ask Maryland one had a really neat one where a person wrote in and said, what I don't understand is my neighbor's grass always looks so much greener and so much better than mine. It looks so much better. And she said, so Marilyn, what I did was I went into her yard and I stood on her side of the fence and I looked and my grass looked so much better. I'm so confused. Why does my grass look so much better from there? And Marilyn, one, complimented her. She said, you did something most people never do. You went into their yard and you looked back at your own yard. And she said, what you don't understand is that from the perspective of their yard, you could see all the little piles of dirt in their yard, but you can't see those in your yard from their perspective. And in the same way, when you're in your yard, you can see your little dirt and your little, little mistakes and all these little things, but you can't see it in other people's yards because you're not close enough. And it's contentment. That's the things that in each person's life, in our own life, our own struggles, our own areas, we all have little, little things that if we focus on, we could put all our energy on, our concentration into, and have a hard time finding the contentment God has for us. And so if you're in your Bibles, go to 1 Timothy. And now I know the whole series is things Jesus said about money. And we will get to what Jesus said about money, but what we're going to see in 1 Timothy is Paul applying things Jesus taught about money, where we're going to see someone actually doing what Jesus says to do. I got to admit, today, it's easy to worry, right? It's easy to be anxious. It's easy to worry. Right now, I'd say things are upside down. Anybody agree with that? Things are upside down in our world. So I began this message with a question, is anyone experiencing worry today? Anyone, like you don't have to raise your hands, but anyone have anything to worry about? Any, anyone have anything they're anxious about? Online can, you know, get an amen on that one. Just type that in on comment in a week or two. But however that works. But people are experiencing worry, anxiety, concern for today and for tomorrow. As I mentioned, we began last week talking about money. And it seems so trivial right now. Yet in a real way, money and these ideas they go so much bigger than silver like the whole point of priorities the whole point of contentment it's so much bigger than money but money's like the the action way we can see whether we're doing or not is my faith in this is my trust in this am i really trusting in god our values our level of trust our level of lack of trust this is what we're talking about today we're talking about contentment and i would say you can only be content in your life if you're trusting in God. You can only be content if you have a place of trust. I absolutely have no reason to believe tomorrow is going to be okay if I'm not in a relationship with God. Right? Does anybody turn on the news? Do we need to pause and turn on the news right now? Things are wild. But if I have my trust in God, 
I know it's going to be okay. Contentment is a place of trusting God and a place where God puts us. And we're trusting where he's going to take us and we're trusting the path and the road. So if you have your Bibles, you're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be in 6 through 10. And I'll read from the ESV. If you have the NIV, it's going to be a little bit different but similar idea. If you have the King James, it'll be a little bit different from that, just harder to understand. But we'll be in, I'm going to be in the ESV, beginning in 6. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have been brought, for we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into the ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. To try to make that more Danielized, the love of money can really mess you up because that's everything you want to go after. That'll consume your your passion, your soul, your mind, all of it. Now, Paul right here is warning Timothy in ministry not to become a preacher who chases after silver and gold. That's the real warning because Timothy is all about your ministry. As you go forward in life, as you go into to leading a church, if you will, as you go into these things, don't be one of those guys who pursues the dollar above all else because it will cause you to sell out your ministry. He says they wandered from the faith because they're so caught up with the dollar. But it goes bigger than that. We're also going to use this to see what money and what the lack of contentment, what it can do with our life and how to get focused back. Go into the things Jesus said about money. Jesus, when he was talking to the disciples, when he had just prayed and they heard him pray, and they're like, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray, because the way you pray seems to be very, very different than the way we pray. And so he asked, they asked him that question, and he gave the Lord's Prayer. And in Matthew six eleven. he states, Give us today our daily bread, which is a huge thing that Jesus said about money, is that our provision, our sustenance, our day-to-day needs to come from God. He's saying, be satisfied with the thing that I give you. Find contentment in these things. Don't just chase after the bigger and the better. Find your joy and your contentment where I've provided for you. Anybody know the story of manna? I know a lot of us know the story of manna, and online you may or may not, but when God gave manna as they were wandering through the desert, as we know, He gave them just enough for today. He said, you can't store it up. You can't put six of them in a little bucket. You can't have it for tomorrow because when you wake up, it's all going to be rotten and spoiled and covered in maggots because He didn't want them storing up and putting their faith and their hope and their trust in that bread, in that manna. He wanted their hope and their faith and their trust in Him. Be satisfied with your daily provision from God. Matthew 6, 25, a little later down in Matthew, Jesus told him, don't worry about this life. Don't worry about life. Don't worry about death. Don't worry about what you will eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you will drink. Don't worry about your body. Don't worry about these things. Because isn't life more than food and clothing and shelter and body? Isn't life bigger than that? Right, isn't it? As I was preparing this message, I came to a question, and it really sent me down a rabbit trail, and really could have sent me down to a whole other sermon and, and writing a book or something. But I asked the question as I was preparing, I said, why did God want us to eat? Do you ever think about that? Like, why did, why did God decide it was important for, some, for us to eat? I mean, He created the sun and the plants and trees. They don't eat. They gain their energy from sunlight, right? 
they gain, or they have to have water, but even on that, God, the creator of all great and wonderful and mighty things, could he not have created us in a way that did not require food and did not require water? I mean, Adam and Eve were given bodies where they were going to live forever had sin not come into the world, right? Yet they needed food, and they needed drink, and they needed to eat the tree of life to maintain the status quo of living forever. Why would God want us to eat? Now, this question can easily become, what did God want us to eat? And that's a whole other um, industry, if you will. I mean, if you read it, we're supposed to eat herbs, fruits, vegetables that have seed, which when I read that list, I thought, well, maybe that means no mushrooms. Maybe we shouldn't have mushrooms, which for the most part, I'm okay with that. Uh, but he gave this list of things worse we could eat in the garden at the time. And there's been a whole industry based around the Daniel fast. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo, these guys said no meat, and they ate a bunch of veggies and nuts. And, and there's books written about it, and fortunes have been made arguing over what God wanted us to eat. Did he want us to eat the paleo diet? Did he want us to eat the keto diet? Did he want us this diet or that diet or the Mediterranean diet? What did God want us to eat? Leviticus covers a lot of things for Jews at the time, but that's not us. But my question, why did God want us to eat? When I think about it, it seems to me our very first struggle as humanity was a food struggle. Having fun in preparation, I said Adam and Eve had an eating disorder, right? They had an eating disorder because they got super focused craving the one thing they were told they couldn't have, which I still think is chocolate. But they were super focused craving that one thing that had been forbidden because that's how we work. The one forbidden thing, that's what we want. They threw off contentment. They shunned it. They refused all of their provisions. God said, you can eat everything here. You can eat all the herbs and all the vegetables that have seed and all the fruit trees that produce seed. You can eat every single thing. But this one little bitty tree, just stay away from that one. And so that's what they went after. Why did he want us to even have this need whatsoever. I would love to just say open it up and let's ask and see people's, what people's recommendations are, but that seems a little weird for a sermon. But can you take a moment and realize how utterly dependent we are on God? How absolutely utterly dependent. By the way, that's the answer to contentment. If we were to end the sermon now, that's the answer. It's this dependence has to be on God. So why did he want us to have a need of food in the first place? So we would be dependent upon his provision. Again, as I asked, do you realize how utterly dependent you are on God? In a really, really big church, I would ask, you know, raise your hands all that are a self-made man. But I did not say don't do that. But I will tell you the answer is there is no such thing. As a self-made man, how can I prove that? Answer this to me. How far can you get without air? How are you going to do without it? you got like four to six minutes and that's it. How far are you going to make it without God's provision of air? Not far. How far are you going to get without God's provision of food? About eight to 21 days, depending on if you're like me or if you're naturally thin. Well, depend on how long you're going to get without food. How are you going to do without water? No, oh, about three days. Right? About three days without water, that's it. And we could go into extremes. I started getting too far into this. I was looking at like the sun. How long can man go without sunlight? About six months. Well, uh, except for extreme cold, like if there was no sun. How long can we go without gravity, without food, without water, without vitamins, without acids in your body? The things we don't enjoy, like cholesterol, serve a purpose. The things we don't enjoy, like pain, serves a very specific purpose. I think everything in the world has a purpose except for maybe mosquitoes and people who say roll tide. Those two things don't really have a purpose, but everything else 
has a purpose. As I was preparing, I said, this land is not your land. This land is not my land. This land is Jehovah's land. This land is Yahweh's land. It's Jesus' land. The great gift of contentment, we're going to find in verses 6 to 8, where he says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain. Quit chasing after everything else because contentment contentment is found in chasing after God godliness is where great gain is did you know and if you like to write things down write this down even contentment is a gift of God you can find contentment because Jesus gives that to you you can't find it on your own you can't just go out there and get it you can find contentment because it has to be and is provided by God. Jesus talked about the flower, how dressed up it is, and how, how the flower is more beautiful than all that Solomon had and all of his wealth. And he talked about how the birds, they don't worry the least bit about what they're going to eat. They just go out and be birds. And he says, how much more should you be content because God who provides for the flower and provides for the bird provides for you. But it doesn't end there. Augustine, a monk from the 15th century or a little earlier than that in Germany wrote, I have no hope at all, but in thy great mercy, grant what thou commandest and command what you will. Thou dost enjoin on us continence, and when I knew, saith the one, that none could be content except God gave it, this also was itself a part of wisdom, to know whose gift it was. None can be content unless it is God who gives you contentment. This is why Philippians, Paul says, I am not saying this because I am in need. Catch this. He gives us huge statement. He says, I'm not saying it because I am in need. For I have learned that I can be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I am well-fed or I am hungry, whether I am living in plenty or I am living in want. I have found what it is to be happy and content when I am well-fed. I have struggled with that when I am hungry, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? When I have plenty, I'm good. When I have a lot more week than I have paycheck, it's a lot harder. And Paul is saying you can be content in all of it, in all of it. And then the next verse he tells us how. He said, and before I give it away, anybody know the secret? Anybody, anybody online want to type in the secret real quick? The secret to be in content in all things, right here, I can do all things through Christ who gives me that strength. I can be content with where I am today because Christ gives me that. What does that sound like? Does that sound like trust to anybody else? That I can trust Christ so much that I am content whatever comes my way? I cannot be content no matter what comes my way if I do not trust Him who has me there. And I can be absolutely content in whatever comes my way if I trust Him who has me where I am in life now. Paul wrote a lot of the passages we're in today. I know we're studying what Jesus said about money, but Paul wrote a lot of the passages we're, we're going through today. And so the question is, how awesome did Paul have it? Like we know when he was young, he was wealthy. We know when he was young, he was a great religious leader. We know that, that when he was working some of the ministry, he also worked as a tent maker, which was a great way to make a living then. So how wealthy, how well did Paul have it? Around the time that Paul made the statement, I can do all things, around this time he also said this, Five times Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent an entire night and day floating at sea, adrift at sea. I have faced many dangers from rivers and robbers. I have faced dangers from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I have faced dangers in cities. I have faced dangers in the desert. I have faced dangers in the sea. I have faced dangers from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and I've often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. This guy is the one who talks to us about contentment, that I have found contentment because Christ gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ. How is it he was content? And how can we be content by that same idea that it is Christ? When my trust is big enough, I can be content in whatever comes my way, whether it's hardship, whether it's struggle. You know what's really interesting? If you ever really look at the studies, you seem to find more contentment in the house of the poor than the house of the rich. You find more contentment in the elderly who are suffering than the young full of energy and life. You find more contentment in the sick and affirmed and broken cancer patient. The the people who've gone through real tragedy find more contentment than those who've skated through life. And the reason is the moment where they got to where they had to trust Christ. He got them through. The moment where they, they, they saw the life isn't about all these things. It's not about reputation and popularity and all of these things. Life is about dependence on God. And at that moment, you know the answer of why God made us need to eat in the first place. Because God wanted us to see Him as our means for provision, and to see Him as He who provides our needs. We can be content. We can be content. And as I was preparing this, I did ask the question, what about ambition? Is it wrong? Like, are we saying it's wrong to be ambitious? No. No, not at all. But what Paul is saying is the same thing Jesus said, that we have to be ambitious about the right things. I can be absolutely ambitious ambitious about righteousness and yet be content with where God has me because Jesus said what hunger and thirst for righteousness and then all these other things will be added to you hunger and thirst for him verse 9 and 10 tells us again but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful de- desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For it is the love of money that is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It is the love of things that so harm and so keep us from finding contentment and finding trust in Jesus. Focus on the Family gives us great list of, of how to live contently. And I love these little tools, things that, okay, if I do these things, I may be able to live how I should. I may be able to find contentment. I may be able to, to feel more like me. I may be able to find a point in my life where the madness quiets where the insufferable becomes something we can just move right on through because my focus and my faith and my hope is in Jesus Christ. Number one, establish a reasonable standard of living. It's the first one. It means I don't have to have every single thing out there. I have to trust in Jesus to meet my needs. Remember going back when I talked about the Jews and manna and how God gave them manna? At some point they were like, you know what? This honey-flavored bread stuff that grows on the ground miraculously in the desert, well, it's not good enough. It meets all of our needs, but it's kind of tired of it. We'd like some meat. 
So God gave them pigeons, and then they complained some more, and he cursed them for a little bit because you people are always complaining. You're never finding contentment in anything. I'm making miracles happen before you, and you're like, yeah, this miracle doesn't taste like chocolate, though. And so they had to deal with some of that. Number one, establish a reasonable standard of living. Enough is enough. Good enough is good enough. Ability to make it and do the things God wants for me is what I really need to do. Number two, establish a habit of giving. Establish a habit of giving. You know how hard it is to live a life like this? where You're just squeezing on and all you think about is me, 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 my. It's all mine. It's my world. You know, good luck. You can't go four minutes without air. You, know, you think you're in charge of everything. But when you have a life of an open-handed, where well, God, I trust you to use me as a conduit for your will, it's amazing how he also takes care of you. Establish, establish a habit of giving. Absolutely. One of the blessings Jesus talked about, this woman who came into the temple, and you had people coming in with big sacks of gold and they're just dumping and making all these noises and and playing trumpets and covering themselves in ash for the tithe that they did and this little old lady just gave a little bitty penny in essence and Jesus talked about her faith and he said listen guys he said she gave all she had she gave out of her poorness these other people are given out of their wealth and thinking, look at what all God's doing. God doesn't care about the dollar amount. He cares about the heart. He says she gave out of her poorness and God's going to bless her more so than all of these rich people combined because she gave out of her heart. I used to have this pastor that would say all the time, and I loved it. My mom used to tell it to me all the time too. But he would always say that God doesn't use the tithe to raise money because he does not need money but he uses the tithe to raise his people to teach discipline to his people to teach them not to be greedy so one establish a standard of living Two, establish a standard of giving number three establish priorities is focus on the right things focus on Righteousness, focus on family, focus on friendship, focus on the right things. Number four, develop a thankful attitude, attitude of gratitude. Be grateful with what God has brought into your life now. It's funny how sometimes it's been a really, really long, painful, frustrating day and you're ready to just scream at everything and everyone if you take a moment and see what God has done for you. God, before I slam that door, thank you for there being a door. Thank you for the fact that I have a house to walk into and there's somebody there to greet me. Thank you that there's little ones around who just keep spilling drinks, but there's little feet running around. Thank you for the fact that I need to cut the grass and that it's tall and the lawnmower starts and I have a yard to actually go cut. Thank you for the job where the boss drives me crazy because it provides provision for my family. The little things focus on the right priorities. Help bring contentment. Number five, reject a fearful spirit. This is huge. So much greed goes into fear. I'm so afraid of what may happen that I stop being one who is a conduit for God. Reject a fearful spirit. Trust God enough to say he's okay. He's going to make me okay. Number six, seek God's will. Philippians 3.8, Paul said, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. Number seven, not just reject fear, but stand up to fear. I'm going to trust God so much that I'm going to do number eight, which is trust God's promise. Trust what He's promised you. Trust what He's doing in your life. There once was a pilot 
who was flying over, every time he'd fly over Appalachia, Tennessee, Appalachian Mountains, every time he'd fly over, he would just stare down at the same little plot of land, week in, week out, week in, week out. And so finally his co-pilot said, what is it about this land? What is so interesting that you keep looking every time we fly over at this one acre? He said, when I was a boy, I'd sit right there at that stream on this log fishing. And every time a plane would fly over, I would look up and I would just so dream of being up there flying the plane as a pilot. He said, now every time when I fly over, I look down and I just dream of being on that log fishing. Right? <laughs> That's what I dream of now, is just being back fishing. We should take our lead from trusting God and trust Him and be content at where God has us. And know that God's going to move us in and out of the doors He wants for us. And in the meantime, trust the place we are right now. One of the curses, one of the, the judgments that God brought those Israelites who didn't like manna, those Israelites who, who kept complaining every time he would do some amazing miracle for them, is at some point, if you read it, he sent a bunch of poisonous snakes in. A bunch of poisonous snakes came in and bit them, bit them for griping and complaining. And then he told Moses to... to put a serpent on a rod it's kind of basically made the emblem of a cross and he told them that if they want to just be stubborn and be themselves they can and they'll just die or they can look at the serpent on the cross and if they look at this they will be healed and that seems like pretty easy it's hard to believe that anybody still died but it still comes down to the fact that even at this moment God was saying, I have a provision for you. You can accept it or not. I have what you need. You can be content with it or not. You can look or you can believe in your own way. You can look or you can do your own thing. You can be all about you or you can do the things that I said to do. And that is where contentment is found. You want to move that up 2,000 years? He put his son on a cross. He said, I've met your needs. You can look to me or not. You can accept me or not. You can do your own thing or not. You can meet your own needs or not. Contentment cannot be achieved without complete trust and surrender. Because contentment means I am letting you provide for me. Come what may, your provisions I accept because I trust you fully and completely. So in whom do you trust? Is it you? Is it God? Is it you? Is it Jesus? In whom will you trust? As we close, I keep thinking of Israel and I have to go back to an Israelite who said, choose this day whom you will serve. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The options are yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, it's amazing that a, a conversation on being content can really open our eyes to how awesome you are and how awesome your provisions are, how mighty and holy and righteous and perfect you are, and how we have a choice and you have always, 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 given us the option to choose we can choose you or not but we can't choose us and also you you're in charge or we are in charge you are god or we are in god or we are god you provide everything or we provide everything so lord god speak to our heart and give us the courage to let go to be open-handed with you as our lord and our savior and say god I can't do this on my own. I can't even get close to doing it on my own. Thus, I will trust in you. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting all of our spiritual, physical, emotional needs. Thank you for giving us the ability to be content. 
Remove the anxiety, remove the worry as we present it and leave it with you. Give us peace. Give us your overwhelming spirit of peace. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come join us Wednesday night as we do a chili cook-off. And we have candy and we have all kind of good stuff. Six o'clock Wednesday night. 6.30 Wednesday.